time you can still get some home projects and those kind of things done and honeydews and um, yeah so anyway let's get to the book of James before I get myself in trouble all right James chapter 1 uh, we left off in verse number 8 a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways uh, we were talking about asking faith I um, mean asking for wisdom and uh, talking about being double-minded and the, and the thing to remember that is when it comes to wisdom um, you have to ask for wisdom from God for the right kind of wisdom. Um, too often times we go to God for worldly wisdom and not for godly wisdom. We go for God to give us an answer to our problems instead of asking God what his, what his will is. And we seek the wrong kind of wisdom instead of asking God, hey, give us wisdom so we can see the right kind of thing instead of giving you the wisdom so I can see it my way. And that's a bit of a difficult thing. Because we want it our way. We don't want it God's way most of the time. And, um, and the Lord's like, no, I'll give you what you need. Uh, give you the grace to get through it. But you're going to get the grace that I give you, not the grace that uh, you want. Not the wisdom that you want, the wisdom that you need. Um, and the other thing that I, that I wrote down in this or looking through it is there are some times where people ask for wisdom and they're asking through the wrong motive. Um, and God doesn't give them any wisdom or give them any truth. A uh, great example of that is when um, Jesus stands before Herod and he asks him who he is and Jesus doesn't say anything to him because uh, Herod's there to consume it upon his own lust. He's not really interested in who Jesus really is. He's just interested in, in being right or being identified or having some say in the matter. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a wicked motive, it's a wicked motivation behind why he's interested in having a conversation with Jesus. It's not because he's really interested in the truth. And um, so sometimes when you don't get an answer on things, it might be because you're not really interested in the truth. You're just interested in what you want. And um, that can be a dangerous thing. And, uh, you know, it's, that, that's a, it's a difficult place to be when you get, you get in your mind, you get fixed in your mind that, well, Lord, if you would just do this, I know it would work out the right way. And... It's hard not to feel that way and hard not to think that way. But the reality is you and I can't see 30 seconds in front of us as to what's going to happen. We can't see 30 days down the road that if the Lord answers this, answers this or gives this or does this in the way you see fit, um, you know, you don't see the result of where that decision leads out and all of the other tentacles and the things that it does and the impact on the people's lives and, and who it impacts across the you know, across the whole entire spectrum. And God's sitting on his throne looking down and he goes, you know what, I see if I do this, it's not only, it's not only going to affect this person, it's affecting this one and 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 this one. And he sees how far outreaching that little ripple effect is. And, you know, that's, that's one of the more difficult things as a Christian is to go, well, Lord, why are you doing this? And you may not realize it, you may not ever get an answer on it until you get to heaven and then you look and the Lord shows you the whole thing and you're like, oh, well, I see why you did it that way. And I see what you were working on and I see what was happening. And it's a hard place to be in. And so sometimes the Lord doesn't necessarily give you light on it right now. Sometimes he gives you light on it after the fact and then sometimes he never gives you light on it. Um, and it's just all on you and I to have the faith to trust that God's right and we're wrong and he knows the best and we don't. And one day he'll show us exactly what we need to see and you know, and we'll go from there. So that's, that's where we were at last night, last time. The, uh, but we, in verse 8, he says, A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You know, that's, that's such, a, <laughs> such an easier said than done, right? Um, it's easy to say, I want God. I want the things of God. I want, to do, I want to do what God wants me to do. And then you have this dirty, rotten flesh that is fighting against you all the time. And Paul talks about the law of sin that warreth in my members. And your, and your flesh is desiring this worldly stuff and the, your spirit's desiring spiritual things. And there's this constant battle. And a an, an, an double-minded man is somebody who's trying to hang on to the world and trying to hang on to God at the same time. And there are two boats going in two completely separate directions. And sooner or later, that man's going to get ripped in half because he can't continue to stand and he can't continue to, to hang on where he's at. He's got to let go of one or the other um, or he will be torn into pieces. And there's a lot of Christians that struggle. There's a lot of saved people that struggle with things because they're hanging on to too much of the world and they won't let go of the world and hang on to God. Um, and that's a, 
that's a difficult place to be and that's a tough place to be, but you, you and I have to learn to let go of the worldly things and trust God and hang on to God and let God sort it out and say, you know what, Lord, it's in your hands. You know what's going on. You know where I need to be. You know what the will is for my life. I don't, and I'm going to lean on you, and whatever the world does, the world does. My flesh isn't going to like it. The world's not going to like it. The devil's not going to like it, but God, I'm hanging on to you. And you'll find in your life a place of stability, a place you can stand, that when difficult times come, you're not being ripped in two different directions. You're not being torn apart and going, well, why God is this and why God? You're like, you know what? God's right. I'm wrong. We're just going to keep going in this direction. And so that's what you want to be careful of um, when you look at that. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, verse number nine, let a man of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Um, this is verses 9 through 11 is going to be the first time you're going to see James begin to talk about the rich and the poor. And like we've talked about, James is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. It is not written to you and I in the church. There is some great practical, spiritual teaching that we're going to get out of the book of James. But doctrinally speaking, this book is making application to the 12 tribes in the middle of the tribulation and stuff that's going to happen in the tribulation. And in the tribulation, there is a correlation between being rich and being poor and the spiritual nature of those two things. And what you will find is a lot of good, godly people will get up and preach that if you're rich, you're out of the will of God, and if you're poor, you're in the will of God. Um, I remember when I was in Bible school, the, it, was a, it was a joke in Bible school, it wasn't taught, but it was a joke that if your car had at least two bumper stickers keeping the bumper on your car, then you were spiritual. Um, you know, if your car was less than 10 years old, you were not spiritual, um, which was kind of hard because I bought a new car while I was in Bible school, and uh, I wasn't spiritual because I had a new car. But there was this teaching going around that, well, they're poor, so God's, you know, they're, they're, they're suffering for Jesus because they're poor. No, maybe they just don't know how to manage money. Or maybe God didn't give them the ability to go out and earn, earn a living. God didn't give them the ability to know how to handle money. God didn't give them what they needed to be able to make smart financial decisions. They just lived by however they wanted to live and spent whatever they made and didn't plan for tomorrow and didn't put up and didn't store and just... You know, well, I'll work tomorrow and keep on working. And that's not, that has nothing to do with your spirituality at all. That just has to do with you don't know how to handle money. Um, you know, if you go out and get a credit card and run up, rack up debt on a credit card, that's not financial wisdom. That's worldly wisdom that just says, I want it now. I don't want to work for it. I don't want to hang, you know, I'm not willing to put aside. I'm not willing to delay gratification. I just want what I want now. And I'll work, I'll, work, I'll, work, I'll work for it and pay for it later, which is an insane way to live your life, to put stuff down on a credit card. I mean, when you look at, and it's not just the world. I mean, that's what's wild to me is there, the Bible has so many things on financial wisdom, and I'm not going to get into Dave Ramsey and all that stuff, um, you know, and how spiritual he tries to make being that, that stuff. But the Bible has plenty of great teaching in the book of Proverbs and throughout the Bible about how to save and how, how a man ought to, to keep his finances and all of those kind of things. I mean, he, the Lord tells you multiple times, a borrower is subject to the lender. You keep borrowing money, sooner or later the bank's coming to get whatever you got because you can't make the payment any longer. And you and I live in a world where, especially the, especially the generation behind me, my generation and the generation behind me, where they don't worry about how much something costs, they worry about the payment. I mean, I remember coming up when you bought a car, like a long car loan was like 60 months. Like, I mean, my, when I was coming up, my dad had a rule. If you can't pay for a car in three years, you can't afford it. That was his rule. So when I bought my first car, um, out, my first new car, he was like, look, if you can't pay for it in three years, you don't need to buy it. And now, what do you have, 84 months, 96 months? I mean, 96 months on a vehicle is insane. I mean, the car, the car is probably not, if, if you drive as much as I do, in 96 months, the car's not even driving anymore. I mean, you know, I mean, right now with what we're doing, I'm averaging about 40,000 miles a year on my truck. In 96 months, that's 400,000 miles. I don't know too many cars that have 400,000 miles on them that you're not putting a new motor in and a new transmission and everything else in. 
I don't really want to still be making payments in 96 months. That's eight years. That's crazy. But, you know, I, I've talked with a young man yesterday. He went out and bought a $90,000 truck. He's 22 years old. Concrete, you know, he works in the concrete business. He doesn't own the company, just an employee of the company. But, well, the, the, I could afford the payment. I'm like, <laughs> how do you eat? And he's like, well, you know, I mean, it, it gets a little tight here and there. And I'm like, who is loaning 90 grand to a 22-year-old for a vehicle? I mean, in, I don't know anybody that just lets a 22-year-old sign on a note for a $90,000 vehicle, but somebody said, well, we'll give this kid a shot. And the, the sad thing is, is they know it's going to be repossessed within a year or two, and they go ahead and loan it out anyway because they know they can turn around and resell it and make, make their money again on the same deal whether the kid makes the first payment or not. <clears throat> but you have, you have people, but anyway, I don't know how I got off on that. It has nothing to do with what's going on in James. But it's frustrating to me to, to see those things happening. But in the book of James, what's going on is James is, is making an illustration about where some things are going to be in the tribulation. Um, and l- let me back up real quick. Let me show you something. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, just to show you that whether you're rich or poor in the church age doesn't make you spiritual one way or the other. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians 1.1 1, 1, just so we can see who the book is to. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, to the faithful in, the Christ, in Christ Jesus. So can we all agree that Ephesians is to the church? It's to saints, it's to save people in the church age. Now turn over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And James is fixing to show you, not James, Paul is fixing to show you in the book of Ephesians that there are masters and servants in the church. Look at verse 5. He says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And then verse 9, And ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither there is respect of persons with him. So Paul is is saying in the church there is both a master and a servant. There's two different different groups of people, and neither one of them has nothing to do with your spirituality if you're in the church. They're both saved people. They're both going to heaven. Just one of them is financially in a better place than the other one. You know, I, would, I, and I don't know anybody's financial position, but I would dare say there's some wealthy people in this church and there's some not-so-wealthy people in this church. And that has nothing to do with whether they're spiritual or not. There's some rich people that are extremely spiritual, and, I mean, thank God for some folks that gave outside of this church that are extremely wealthy that helped us get into that building over there. I remember being in school and Dr. Ruckman used to say, man, I'm praying for a millionaire, I'm praying for a millionaire. Because let's, the reality is... That doesn't get done without money. You know, you can will it all you want, but nobody's, I've never paid a contractor in goodwill. When the contractor does work, he wants a check. And so thank God for some rich Christians who saw a need and saw an opportunity to do something for the Lord and said, you know what? God's given me and I'm going to give back to give back to the Lord and this, here's how I want to do it. And I want to give it to Bible Believers Baptist Church. I mean, it's... It, it amazes me that there is people who, who have not darkened the doors of this church that have written just unbelievably generous gifts to our church to allow us to do that. That's the Lord. That's the Lord putting it on somebody's heart who's done something. Now listen, there's been a lot of good people who have done a lot of work over there who probably haven't given a tenth of what those folks have given, and they're just as spiritual as the guy who wrote the check. There, there's no difference in the two, but come to the tribulation, turn over to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, in the tribulation, it's going to be extremely hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. Matthew 19, and look down at verse 23. 
It says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look over at uh, Matthew, is it 25? I didn't write that one down. Turn over to Psalms chapter 52. Psalms chapter 52. In the tribulation, and here, I mean, it's, and, the, and the reality is that it's, it applies today, even though this doctrinally it fits for the tribulation, but the reality is rich people in the United States or rich people in the world anywhere trust in their riches. They trust in their wealth to keep them safe. They trust in their wealth to take care of them, and they, don't have, they do not see a need to trust in God. Very few rich folks trust in the Lord. But if you get over to Psalms 52, look down in verse number 7. We'll back up there. Look at verse number 5. It says, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of, the, of thy dwelling place and root, root thee out of, thy, out of the land of the living Selah. Just as a, a note here, if you're, when you're reading through the book of Psalms and you see that word Selah, Selah, however you, however you choose to say it, that is a reference to the second coming. That's a reference to something that's going to happen in the future, something the Lord's going to do out there once we're out of here. Um, but look on down. So, we're, so, we're, so this, thing, this passage is prophetically speaking of something that's going to happen down the road. Look in verse number 6. It says, The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that, that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance, of the, the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So a rich man trusts in his, in his riches. If you want to turn back over to James 2. A rich man trusts in his riches and he doesn't trust in God. You ever try to witness into a rich person? Uh, they, I'm good. I don't, I don't need anything. I've got all I want. I'm fine. I mean, it, and it doesn't matter what walk of life they're from. If they've got money, they're, they, they're good. Uh, I'm, we're fine. We don't need anything. And it typically in a rich person's life, just the, the few that I've had the opportunity to know, the only way that God's ever able to get through, through to them is typically some tragedy befalls them in their life. Some tragedy that money doesn't fix. Some tragedy that, that throwing dollars at it can't, can't just make it all go away. And they, ha and they have a need to want to cry out to God. And so in the tribulation, there's going to be the rich and there's going to be the poor. And the rich are going to be the ones that are typically going to be in control. They're going to be the ones that are running everything. They're going to be the ones ruling the world. And they're not really going to have a need to go after God. Because the Antichrist is going to continue to take care of him, going to continue to give him what he needs. And so it's going to be really hard for a rich man to give up his riches and turn to, turn to God and get saved in the, in the tribulation. And so that's what, that's what James throughout this book is going to be warning these folks of about being rich and being poor. Um, look there in verse number 10. He says, uh, we, yeah, we covered that. But the rich that he's made there at low... The fire of the grass shall pass away, for the sun is, so, is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the, withereth the grass, and the flower falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also the rich man fade away in his ways. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised of them that love him. A uh, preacher just covered these crowns a few weeks ago, so I won't belabor the point. Um, but this is a crown for enduring temptation. Um, over in uh, Revelation chapter 2 is a good cross-reference for the crown of life. It's also known as the martyr's crown. Um, and it's for folks who die for the cause of, uh, cause of Christ. Uh, the other crowns you've got, just as a way of remembrance, is the incorruptible crown. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, you have the crown of rejoicing, uh, which is a soul winner's crown. There in Ephesians, you have the crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy. Uh, for people who love his appearing, and you have the crown of glory for taking care of God's sheep over there in, in Peter. Um, and then verse 13 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Let me slow down here. So, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. So, God's directive will will turn a Christian over to the devil on purpose. If a person's not doing what they're supposed to do, God can allow the devil to take him captive at his will. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll turn to a few references here. Uh, 
1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 20, it says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Turn also over to 1 Corinthians 5. So Paul's turning over two guys to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. And Hymenaeus and Alexander were saying there is no millennium, that the Lord had already come and everything else is... Uh, Everything else is just figurative and allegorical, um, is essentially what they are teaching. They're all millennialists. Um, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, we're dealing with a guy here who was um, in, a false, in a bad relationship with his, with his stepmom. And in verse 5, he says, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so there's times where God allow a Christian to be turned over to the devil, that his flesh would be destroyed so that he'd still have something to judge the seat of Christ. So that he'd still have something preserved, just, just take him out of the way, remove him, and preserve what he's already gotten so he doesn't lose all of it. Um, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, the devil is given permission to do this by the Lord. Second, Second Timothy chapter 2, and look at verse 26. Uh, look at verse 24. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the stare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. So an individual who, is, who will acknowledge the truth, who repents when they see the truth about what they've done, can recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. But sometimes God will let that person go and let them run their course and take his hand off of them and let the devil just have them until they go, you know what, I'm wrong. And that guy over there in 1 Corinthians 5, he finally comes back, he gets right about what he did. And Paul over there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, hey, the guy's apologized, he's repented, he stopped doing what he was doing, he made a turn, repentance, remember, is not... Repentance is, is, is a change of direction. He was going this way, and he said, you know what, I'm not going to go that way, I'm going this way because the way I was going was wrong. He repented of what he did, and he said, you know what, I'm wrong, the church was right to put me out, and now I'm ready to get back in. And then the church was like, no, we don't want you back, and Paul goes, no, you let the guy back in, he's repented, he's, he's made it right, and he's willing to move forward. And so, so sometimes in, a, in an individual's life, the Lord will just let them run their course, take his hand off of them, and let them go and let their life run the course that it'll run just so that they'll learn, they'll learn the truth they need to learn. Or he'll let their flesh just be destroyed, take them out, they'll die and they'll go to heaven and they can't mess up anymore. And so that's what back in James 2, that's, that is the, the practical application there in James 1 um, of, what, of what's going on there that... No man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. God's not doing the temptation, but there's times when the Lord will just will allow the temptation to come into your life. Um, so I wrote it down like this. God can allow a temptation. He can lead you into it like the Holy Spirit did Jesus in Luke chapter 4. The, the, in Luke chapter 4, verse 1, it says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. He knew that Jesus was going to face the devil when he got there. But, but he uses the devil to produce it. God does not produce the temptation. He'll, he, the devil produces the temptation. He himself does not stir up the lust in you that produce the temptation. That's your doing. You and I allow our own lust to produce the temptation. God may allow us into a situation where, where it may arise, but it's not him that made the temptation. It's you and I, the lust in our own heart and the lust in our own mind, that conceived that thing, and you'll, and you'll see that. Look, look, let's continue down in the passage so we can see the order of, of when sin does that. But that's where I mentioned earlier there in Romans chapter 7 of what Paul said about the law of sin inside of you. There are, there are things that you know about yourself. There are places that you know you have no business being. And, and you choose to put yourself in that situation, and God does not have to cover you from that when you make the choice to put yourself there. Amen. The devil has, when you choose to put yourself in a situation you know you have no, no, no business being in, God's not required to provide his hand of protection any longer. You made a decision to put yourself there, you're there, and now you're going to have to figure it out. 
And the only way to get out of it is to turn back to Jesus Christ and go, you know what, I should have never been here in the first place. I'm not in the right place. Let me just get out of here and let me be removed from this. And Lord, forgive me under the blood and let's get back into fellowship. But the problem is you take yourself there. You get illuminated with what's going on. You begin to debate in your own mind. Well, maybe in this. Well, if I do this, it'll be that. And you begin to have this debate. Well, the minute you begin to debate something, you've already lost. You know, I mean, it's, it's like when you're trying to lose weight and somebody makes a batch of cookies and puts them on the, on the counter and it's a hot plate and you know there's a glass, there's a brand new gallon of milk in the refrigerator. The minute you smell the cookies, you had better get outside. You had better go do something else. You had better remove yourself from the house or you, if you stay there long enough, the aroma of fresh homemade chocolate chip cookies will envelop you and you will not be able to satiate the lust until you've had about four or five of them with a glass of milk. And if you have committed to being on a diet, you have sinned. You have transgressed. That's, that's the picture of all sin. You put yourself in that situation or allow yourself to... listen. The person who made the homemade cookies did not sin in making homemade cookies. They're not wrong for making cookies. You're wrong because you can't control your own lusts. There's nothing wrong. Listen, chocolate chip homemade cookies. My wife makes these ones that uh, she got a recipe from the people out there in Texas. The, the people in Waco. What are the, the home builder people that gains Chip and Joanna. I don't know where that recipe came from, but they're some of the best chocolate chip cookies I've ever had in my life. And she makes them really big, and I'm just telling you, when they're made, you're not saying no. I mean, like, it just is, I mean, it's like the, I don't know, you just, I mean, they're just there. And it's, I don't want her to think that I'd think she's a bad cook, so I mean, I need to, I need to, you know, boost her confidence that she's doing a great job and let her know how good they are. And... You've got to partake and you've got to have some. But that's how you justify all your sin. Well, I mean, it's for my good and it's, you know, I'm helping somebody else out. And, you know, well, I mean, if I do this deal, I'll make this kind of money on it. And then I can give a little bit more to God. And so it'll be okay for me to do this in order to do that. No, it's never right to do wrong in order to get a chance to do right. No justification of your foolishness, wickedness, transgression is ever acceptable. It is always wrong 100% of the time. And so what, what he's going to show us here in this passage is the order to how sin occurs. Um, he says in verse 13, Let no man say when, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. Um, and so I have this written in my Bible that I got back 20 years ago now when we were in school that's, that Doc gave us. But the order of sin is this. First, you have the presentation. It shows up. It's there. The second thing is you have illumination. You see that something's before you that doesn't belong before you. And you can immediately know whether it's right or wrong. And you can immediately, as uh, I think 2 Corinthians 10 says, bring every, thought, bring every thought into captivity. You see something, the minute it pops in your head, you're like, Lord, that's the wrong thing, get it out. Something comes up on the television, Lord, that's the wrong thing, get it out. But the minute you enter this next phase, the debate, that's where sin enter, enters in. Because consent leads to conception. Consent leads to conception, the debate phase. Then fourth, you have the decision. The fifth, you have the act. And sixth, you have death. Um, it's interesting when you look in verse 15, it says, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, death. You have LSD. Lust, sin, death. There's a lot of LSD. And it ain't just the stuff they used to take in the 70s. Thankfully, that was before my time. I don't even know if the stuff's still around. Um, I just heard stories about it. I'm, I am so thankful that, I, that the Lord 
kept me from those kind of things, that that was never a temptation for me and, and never a, an opportunity because the folks that I know that have messed, not, and like I said, I don't know whether they're messing with LSD, but the folks that have gotten caught up in that stuff, it's, it's like they can't get away from it. And it is, it, 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 it's sad because it's like, the, it's like no matter what they do, no matter how removed they get from it, there's always this insatiable taste that just you can't just quite get rid of. And to see folks go through that and suffer through that and deal with that and, and, and you know, I, it's just really sad. You, you see lives torn apart. You see families torn apart. You see folks who just, they just, I, I just need, I just need, I just need, I just need. I'm, you know, I've had an opportunity to go out a couple of times with Brother Hicks here in the city of Jacksonville and see these folks walk up and they're literally just, some of them are just hooked on dope and they're literally just going from fix to fix to fix and doing whatever it takes to get from a fix to the next fix. And I can't, I can't imagine what that's like to go through that. And I, you know, but that's, that's a, unfortunate. it's a part of our society and they're, no, nobody's doing anything really to stop it and I don't think you will stop it. It's just gonna continue to get worse. Um, but the, the, back to the passage, the lust, sin, death, that thing plays out um, with Achan over there in Joshua chapter 7 and verse number 1. He says, I saw it, it was good, I coveted it, and I took it. Um, Eve does the same thing in the garden. She saw the tree was good for food. She desired to be wise. She desired a good thing. She desired to, to, to have more knowledge, and so she went and did something God told her not to. The, fun, the wild thing is she didn't really desire wisdom for good. She desired wisdom for evil because all she'd ever known was good. She knew God. She knew goodness. She knew all of God's goodness. So what she desired was to know what evil was. You know, it's like when you raise up kids. You don't have to teach a kid how to do good. I mean, you don't have to teach a kid how to do bad. You have to teach them how to do good. They naturally find bad. Like they're just drawn to it. I mean, it's... You know, with our three, uh, you know, they naturally just found a way to get in trouble. I didn't have to tell them, hey, hey, stay away from that. They would just go find it. You know, it's like when you tell a kid don't touch the stove and they've never touched the stove. Like they'll find a way to touch something hot until they're burned. And then once you're burned, you're like, oh, I don't want to do that anymore. And so you have to like get burnt one time before you know, hey, that's not good for me. And unfortunately, that's how it is with sin. You, a lot of times, you've got to get burnt one time before you get away, before you get away from it. The bad thing is, is you never know when that sin is going to grab a hold of you and not let go. And too many times, people have, have said, well, I'm just going to try it just this one time, and the one time's the last time. And, it's, and they're done, and their goose is cooked. And, you know, I mean, I've heard say about the drug thing, not to go back to it, but they say that once a person has, I can't remember if it's crack or heroin but they say once they have the first high all they ever do is try to chase that high and it never comes again but they'll spend every last dime they have to have that experience even though they know they can never have that experience again and they'll continue to, to increase the dose and increase the dose hoping to make it happen and it will never happen again but it's that much of a high all right verse number uh, 16 says do not err my my beloved brethren um uh, do not err, my beloved brethren. So one of the things we back up and say on it, bringing forth death, that is such a contradiction to how the world sees God. When you talk to a worldly person, when you talk to a worldly Christian, you'll hear the statement, and, and we've all heard it, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. No, if a person's a sinner, there is death associated with being a sinner. And there is a punishment associated with being a sinner. Now, if you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation, but you can certainly lose rewards in the judgment of Christ. You can certainly have things taken away from you. You can certainly miss out on opportunities God wants to give you. You can miss out on, on the places God wants to take you and what he wants to show you. Um, but for a sinner who does not repent and turn from his sin, there is a, there is a place called hell, and, there, and God's going to send them. And that sweet, loving little Jesus that wouldn't hurt anybody is not so sweet and, and gentle. Sure. There is a penalty, there, there is a place that he's going to send them to called hell, 
And there's a penalty for sin if they don't repent and turn from their wicked ways. And you, we live in this world that says, well, you know, God's going to just weigh it out. I mean, his scales, you know, as long as his hand's on the scale, you'll always come out on the right side. There is no scale. You're either in Jesus or you're not. You're either living for Jesus Christ or you're, or, or you're either in, in him or you're not in him. It doesn't matter how many of my good works outweigh my bad works. This, the, 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 the crazy, the, the wild trick of the devil is, is every time you think of, well, I'm, I'm better than so-and-so, you never pick, everybody picks Hitler. You know, you're really picking the, the top of the, the barrel there, bud. I mean, you know, why not pick Mother Teresa? Even though she's burning in hell right now if she didn't trust Jesus Christ as her Savior. Nobody ever compares himself to her or compares himself to Gandhi or compares himself to some other person who supposedly did something great in the world. They always pick some dirty, rotten pedophile or some, you know, crazy, insane madman who wanted to conquer the entire world for the person they compare themselves to. How about pick Jesus Christ? How do you compare to him? And if you don't measure up, then you lose. And the only way to get in is through him. And so this idea, so that's what when he says, do not err, my beloved brethren, he's going, hey, don't, don't misinterpret don't misinterpret that there's still going to be a penalty for sin. There's still going to be a penalty for you and I if we, if we continue in sin and don't stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ. And that penalty is a missed opportunity to have rewards on the judgment seat of Christ. And the penalty for you and I is to miss out on hearing, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want to get to heaven and God go, yeah, come on in. That, that's not... I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in getting to heaven and seeing my Savior go, yep, welcome home. I mean, you ever had somebody who when they show up at the house, you're like, man, I wish they weren't here. You ever had a visitor go, oh, gosh, who? <laughs> really? They're here now? I wish they wouldn't have come. You know, you got that person that comes to the Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, and you're like, really, they had to come this year? I don't want God to think that about me when I get to heaven. I don't want to be sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb and have the thought in the back of my mind, you know, I really don't deserve to be here. And I realize none of us deserve to be there. But the reality is it'll be a whole lot easier to sit there if, we, if you've done something for Jesus Christ than if you haven't done anything at all. It'll be a whole lot easier to enjoy the meal. You ever sat at a meal where you knew you were in trouble? Or you'd just gotten in trouble? I mean, the judgment seat of Christ is going to be a difficult spot anyway for all, for all of us, but it, it doesn't have to be supremely difficult. You know, you can still have more good than bad. And it'll be a whole lot better if you get there and you got, you know, maybe a, a ring on your finger or, you know, maybe a crown on your head. I mean, because according to the book of Revelation, he doesn't wipe away all the tears until the end of the millennium, until after the great white throne judgment. So I, I don't, in my mind's eye, there's going to be some Christians that are the marriage supper of the Lamb that may, be, that may be weeping and crying. And it won't be for joy. That's a, you ever think about heaven? Besides just, you know, it'll be a wonderful place. You ever think about where you might fit in all that? I mean, this, this idea, well, you know, if I can just be a street sweeper on the, on, the sweet, on the streets of gold, it'll be wonderful. No, it won't. You don't feel that way in your own life now. You, don't feel, you, you go after things in this life because you desire things, because you want to have stuff, because you desire a reputation, because you desire to be somebody that people look up to, or whatever your reason is. Power, prestige, position. There's another P there I'm forgetting. Politics. But you desire all of those things in your life now, and you're going to tell me when you get to heaven that you're not going to wish you had, had something different up there? You're not going to sit up there and go, well, I used to sit so-and-so in church, and they've got a bigger mansion than me. I realize you'll have the mind of Christ. You won't be able to sin. Every thought you'll think will be the right thought. I realize all of those things, but the reality is it's going to be a reality that when you see brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so with all of this stuff, and you're going, man, I didn't know they loved the Lord that much. And then somebody looks over and you and go, well, I didn't know they loved the Lord that little. Amen. 
That's heaven. That's what heaven's going to be about for the first thousand years anyway that we're, up, that we're there. You get into the millennium and, you're, and, and you see people having the right to rule and reign and some guy that, you, the Herbie, who's sitting on the second row where Brother Donnie sat, who didn't have the right mind in his head 90% of the time is ruling 15 cities and you're stuck in heaven and can't get out of New Jerusalem because you don't have the right garment on. You can't tell me that you're not going to weep over that for the thousand years that, that you're stuck there and, and don't get to leave. You realize that there, you could be bound to the new Jerusalem and not get a chance to explore everything God's created if you don't choose to live for Jesus Christ now? Listen up. New Jerusalem is going to be absolutely wonderful and you'll probably be able to spend, you know, a couple thousand years exploring it and seeing it and visiting all the different mansions that are there and all the different stuff that's there. I mean, you'll have plenty of time to check it all out. But we're not going to be in heaven a couple thousand years. Tens of billions of trillions of years when we're still there, you're still stuck in the same place because you chose to live for yourself here instead of living for him. And you're going, man, I wish I'd have done a little bit more. And it'll be too late once you get there. Once you take your last breath here, it's over with. You don't get to do anything else. You get there, your position is sealed. You still have a chance now to do something about it. And so when you look at that sin and that thing begins to enter in, that, that illumination rises, you better go, you know what? I'm going to walk away from this. It's not worth it. There's something on the other side of here that's a whole lot better than whatever this thing is, than that chocolate chip cookie. And the reality is, a lot of times we swap a chocolate chip cookie for a gold ring. And it's a, it's a scary, I don't, I don't mean to get preachy, but, that, but that's the practical side of the book of James is, is that it does matter how you live after you're saved. It does matter what you do each and every day when you get up and do whatever you do, go to work, take care of your home, raise kids. How you live every day matters. What you think about, what you do, your fellowship with Jesus Christ, it matters each and every day. And it's not a show, it's not a put on, it is a walk with him that requires effort every day. To get up and, and not start the day off with the Lord is to go, you know what, I'm just going to throw this day away. I did the math a while back, I don't remember any, any more how many days you get in your life, but it's something like, 10, something like 25,000 days. It sounds like a lot, but that's like 70 years. That's not a lot. I mean, I remember when I was my kid's age, the 70-year-old seemed like a, you know, ancient of days kind of individual. And now that I'm 45, fixing to be 46, I'm going, it ain't that far away. There's more behind me than there is in front of me. And there's, the time's getting shorter and shorter to get something done for the Lord, and it's not getting any better. And so you better get busy while you can get busy. All right, verse 17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Uh, James here, he mentions gifts. Uh, he doesn't specify gifts. When you get the Apostle Paul, the comparison, the Apostle Paul specifies gifts um, if, in Romans 5 versus, uh, he calls it a free gift in Romans 5.18 about salvation. Um, then he also specifies gifts there in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians 12. Um, and some of those gifts are apostles, teachers, ministering, um, words of wisdom, uh, being hospitable. Those are all gifts that the Apostle Paul mentions. But James here doesn't delineate any of that. The thing you should take from this is, though, James says that all gifts come from the Father of lights. Everything you and I have is because God gave it to us. And everything you give back to God is something he already gave to you. You and I have never given anything to the Lord that he didn't give to us first. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like when my dad gives me something and he goes, hey, can I borrow, can I borrow that thing? Well, yeah, Dad, you gave it to me. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You, you want to, you know, use that drill, help yourself, whatever. Well, the Lord gave it to you, and he, and he just goes, hey, do you mind if I have that back? 
Well, no, Lord, it's mine. You gave it to me. No. Yeah, Lord, it's yours. I wouldn't have it if you didn't give it to me. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have whatever I got if you hadn't given it to me. I wouldn't have, you know, whatever you want to say you have, the reason you and I have it is because God gave it to us. And the, the idea that, well, I, you know, some, I, the, the self-made man thing that you hear in this country is just so unbelievably prideful and selfish and narcissistic, it's unbelievable. Because even the most worldly, ungodly, wicked man, everything he has, God gave him. Everything Bill Gates ever made, Jeff Bezos, any of those guys, Warren Buffett, you know, anything those, any of those guys have is because God allowed them to have it. And anything you have is because God allowed you to have it. And God's going, hey, if, I'm giving it to you, but if you'll give it back to me, I'll give you a little bit more. I mean, it's, you know, it'd be like somebody coming to you and going, hey, I'm going to give you $100,000. And you get the $100,000, you put it in the bank, you see it in the bank, man, you're like, I got $100,000 in the bank. And that's a, well, about you, that's a big deal. I'd love to see $100,000 in the bank. I mean, it'd be nice to see all them zeros and go, man, that's mine. And then God comes back to you and you go, hey, how about giving that back to me? Well, what for? Well, because I'll turn it into a million if you'll let me. I mean, tenfold, that's what the Lord can do. Are you going to turn down a deal where somebody says, if you'll give me a hundred grand, I'll give you a million back? I'm not. I mean, I may check out the fine print and see how they're doing it, but... But with the Lord, that's what you're getting back. The Lord gave you 10 bucks. He's going to give you 10 million if you'll give it back to him. And what, I mean, the father of lights, he gives everything and, and requires nothing in return. But yet if you'll give it back to him, he'll give you so much more. And I don't mean in this life, and I don't mean only in the next life, but in both lives. I've never given the Lord something in this life that, I'm sure it, it will pay off over there, but it's already paid off here. It's, every time the Lord's asked me of something, it's always benefited me in this life in some manner or fashion. And it's always been a benefit to go, okay, Lord, you want that? It's yours. I don't know what you're going to do with it, but it's yours. And in that, to me, that's some of the fun of it. The adventure of the Christian life is the unknown. God goes, hey, give me that. And you go, ah, uh, don't make any sense. And you can't really talk to somebody in the world about it. Because you talk to somebody in the world about doing something for the Lord, and they're like, you're weird. I mean, they already think you're weird. You come to church two or three times a week and give up your, give up your Sundays, and you give up your Wednesday nights. And, you know, well, I mean, you got the Internet. You can just watch it from the house, and you can just do this. And you're like, yeah, but you don't understand. And you and I go, but God. And they're like, but nothing. I'm like, yeah, but that's where you're wrong. It's but God. <laughs> My God's bigger than your nothing. <laughs> but that's the adventure of the Christian life. God goes, hey, give me that. And you go, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden you, get, you let go of it and you're going, man, I'm so thankful I did that. I'm so thankful. I, you know, I mean, I remember 20 years ago when God said to me, hey, I want you to go to Bible school. And I'm like, but do you know what that's going to cost? And I'm standing here now 20 years removed from that, from that decision. And man, the, the benefits are a thousand fold from where I'd be today if I hadn't made the decision 20 years ago. I mean, to, to, to see what God's done with me in 20 something years from Bible school is like that, that decision that I fretted over and struggled over and cried over and wept over and didn't know what was going to happen or how it was going to work out. Now I look back and go, man, that was a pretty little thing. All he was asking me to do was go to school. I wish some of the decisions he had now was just go to school. <laughs> It'd be nice if it was just take a class, you know. And, and the decisions have changed. They've gotten bigger and they've gotten larger, but it's because you've, you've taken steps with the Lord along the way. I mean, you, you can sit in your Christian life when you've walked with the Lord for a little while and go, man, you, you look back on some times in your life where you've fretted and you've gone, man, I just don't know why God's asking me to do this. And you look back now and you're, you're some time removed from it. You're like, man, I'm so thankful I made that decision. And then probably there's some times that God asks you something, asks something of you, and you look back and you go, man, I, I made the wrong decision there. But thank God for the blood that he fixes it, and he can pick it back up, and he can still use it, and he can still do something with it. But, man, you can certainly rejoice over the times you've given God something because the Father of lights always gives back greater than he takes.
and it's a blessing. So we'll stop there in the book of James.